I am Laura Nee. I am the CEO of VPO, and I will just be moderating this session. I am joined by um, Josiah Lockley on the VPO team and as customer success manager. And our guest speaker is Brianna Navarro. So we are very excited to hear all about her project and how sort of the lessons learned and best practices associated with um, how her project went. Um, if you have been in a Zoom webinar, uh, if you could progress to the next slide, Brianna, that would be great. Um, you are in listen only mode. So uh, if you have a question, which we encourage, we will have a specific time at the end to address any questions that people have, but you can certainly ask questions as you uh, hear them being, uh, hear the presentation uh, using the Q&A por portion of Zoom. So go ahead and type in your question and we'll make sure that we address it at the, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, we are recording this presentation and you will be provided uh, the slides of the presentation if you are registered for the event. So if there is anyone else in your organization who wasn't able to attend, uh, they can watch the recording as well. And as well, it will be on our website also. So sit back, relax and enjoy the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Josiah to walk us through the agenda. Thank you, Laura. First, we'll begin with a look at the history of KPFF's work at Greenbridge, followed by the scope of construction, how KPFF implemented VPO for this particular project, some of the successes that came from it, and some of the challenges. Then we'll have closing comments from Brianna, followed by Q&A with you, the attendee. Also bears pointing out that Brianna has provided a lot of quality photos from this project that are in today's presentation. So please enjoy. But before we get to the meat of the presentation, I'd like to introduce Brianna Navarro. Brianna is an associate with KPFF in the Construction Management Group in Seattle. She has degrees in both architecture and construction management from the University of Washington. She has managed construction of a wide variety of projects, including grant funded work, roadway improvements, bridges, building construction, parks, and more. And she has experience with all phases of construction from inception through closeout. Her passion is in doing public works projects and empowering other women in the construction industry. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Brianna. Thanks, Josiah. So we're gonna get started, as Josiah said, with some history of KPFF's work at Greenbridge. And first, to just talk a little bit about KPFF as an organization, we're an engineering and construction management firm with 16 offices across the US. My office is based here in Seattle, and my team does construction management. We do primarily public works projects. I personally focus mostly on transit uh, and transportation and road projects, but the photos here are actually a couple of my other projects a park on the right and then a container terminal on the left. So we do a pretty diverse array of project types, uh, including, like I said, roads. That's kind of my main focus. So the community of Greenbridge is located in the west part of Seattle, specifically the White Center area. You can see kind of with a white box here on the screen, that's where our project location is. And to provide a little bit more background and context, I'm going to first talk about the community as a whole, then a project we did in 2019 on 4th Avenue in Greenbridge, and then we'll get into the Greenbridge Division 8 project. So this is a master plan for the Greenbridge community. And this was previously called Park Lake Homes, which was a neighborhood of World War II era houses built for defense workers. And the homes had really outlived their useful life. So Greenbridge was developed to revitalize the community. Greenbridge was developed by King County Housing Authority, which is an organization that provides affordable housing in the greater Seattle area here in Washington. And KPFF and King County Housing Authority have been working together on master planning, design and construction of this Greenbridge community for the past two decades. This is a hundred acre site developed in multiple phases. 
and work includes building sites and infrastructure. So on the left here is Park Lake homes that existed previously. Uh, and on the right is the new 8th Avenue in Greenbridge. And you can really see the liveliness of this area. Some of the features constructed in the Greenbridge community include an elementary school, a library, a community center, parks, trails, and restaurants. Public art is celebrated with 80 art pieces by 10 artists. And we did have some art on our Greenbridge Division 8 project as well. The community and homes here showcase sustainability and serve a diverse population and income range. And at completion, there will be over 900 homes supported by new roadway infrastructure and improved utilities. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this Fourth Avenue project since it ties in with the work that we did for Division 8. This is a photo of Fourth Avenue in Greenbridge before construction. As you can see, there really wasn't a whole lot here. Um, it was a very flat and straight road and really wide, so people drove extremely fast through this corridor. And it was really important that this area would be safe to travel for pedestrians and drivers in preparation for upcoming housing developments here, including our Division 8 project. There's also a school down the street, so providing a safe school zone here was also a factor, especially with homes being built here that would bring families and children into this area. This project constructed improvements on this road to make it safer for pedestrians and drivers and also install improved utilities. And before we began construction, we presented this project at a community event, which had translators for several of the commonly spoken languages in this area. And there was a lot of interest and engagement in the project and the increased safety that it would provide. And this really showed me how important this project was for this community. It was really cool to be a part of and you know, our client at King County Housing Authority always talks about the vision of the work in this area. And this project showed me the vision. And I really carried that with me moving on into the Greenbridge Division 8 project, which had a similar impact on the community. So these are photos from during construction of 4th Avenue improvements in 2019. And this was designed by KPFF and we also provided construction management and I was the leader of the construction management team. As you can see, we worked to install traffic calming measures like these curb bump outs that you can kind of see in the, the two photos here. Um, they help slow traffic and they also provide shorter distances for pedestrians to cross the street. We added wider sidewalks, new crosswalks, and installed bioretention facilities for rainwater infiltration. And we also installed utilities throughout to improve things like stormwater drainage and provide utility connections for the upcoming housing developments. We also added new illumination and landscaping. So here is a little before and after. You can see quite a difference between these two photos. It's so much safer to drive and walk here. Cars go much slower on this road. And upon successful completion of this project, we moved on to the next big project, which is the project we're really here to talk about today, Greenbridge Division 8. So we're gonna start with some project scope. So just like the 4th Avenue project, KPFF also designed and provided construction management for this project. And so during construction, we worked closely with the contractor. Our team was on site daily for observation of the work. We developed and provided IDRs, which are inspector daily reports. We ran the weekly construction meetings with King County Housing Authority and the contractor to openly discuss issues and progress. And schedule was a big factor that we discussed in those meetings, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. 
we scheduled all the special inspections and testing for this project. So that included soils testing, concrete and asphalt. Since we were building public roadways as part of this project, everything needed to be tested to make sure that things were being built to last. And then we did document control as well for this project. And we did that through BPO. So we did submittals, RFIs, pay apps, change orders, and uh, a lot more through VPO. Okay, so this is a little snapshot of a plan sheet. And this is what we called the Southern parcel of Greenbridge Division 8, that's kind of highlighted in blue here. Um, and then, not sure if you can see my mouse, but up on the very top of the screen here, that is Fourth Avenue. That's the project that I talked about at the beginning. So that's kind of how it tied into this work that we were doing for this project. Uh, work here included asphalt paving, sidewalks, landscaping, and illumination. And we also did utility construction, including power, gas, water, and storm. And then the smaller area kind of on the left here is a 48 foot water quality vault that we installed to collect stormwater. So this is an aerial shot of the southern parcel as we were wrapping up work. And you can kind of see the northern parcel off in the background. Our project was phase one of the work here and a housing development would go here in phase two. So our job on this project was to get the areas prepared and then they would come through after us to build the houses. So because of this, we had to be really diligent about recording exactly where we put utilities and stub outs so that the phase two housing developer could easily come through and make connections and do their installations. So to accomplish this, we wrote really detailed requirements in the specifications for the project so that all the utilities would be surveyed upon completion so that we could get really precise data uh, to provide to the housing developer. And we also required all of the stub outs for this project to be capped and then clearly labeled with wooden posts that had painted labels on them just to really make it easy for the housing developer to, housing developer to come in and do their work. So these are a few photos from construction of the southern parcel. The leftmost photo here is the water quality vault. Like I said, it was a 48 foot vault. It was installed panel by panel with a large crane. And then we came back and poured a sloped concrete topping slab over the floor using a concrete pump truck. And then the top right is some of the utility work that we did along Fifth Avenue. And we did have some deeper utilities here over 13 feet deep. So prior to construction, we coordinated approval of a road closure with King County for safer and more efficient construction. And this was something that we had actually done during the previous Fourth Avenue project as well. So we'd had a little bit of experience previously coordinating a road closure with the King County team in this area. Um, so we kind of already gone through it once, so it was a little bit easier the second time around. And then on the bottom right here is that same road, Fifth Avenue, getting paved with HMA, which is hot mix asphalt. And we had some challenges with that, which I'll talk about a little later in the challenges section. So this is what we called the corner park and work here included irrigation, illumination, stairs, landscaping, and then a decorative carved rock installation at the top. And this is the entry to the community. And this corner is on a really busy road, which is Roxbury in West Seattle. Um, and so this truly is the cornerstone of the community as you drive up. So this was a pretty important piece of work. Here are some photos of the park. On the left is the plaza area with stairs leading up to what you see on the bottom right, which is a the decoratively carved boulder installation that we did. We had to use a concrete pump truck to pour the stairs since access was a little bit tricky in this corner. And then on the top right, you can see the Greenbridge sign, which you can see as you drive up into this community. And we worked with 
King County Housing Authority and our contractor to make sure that the artists for the boulder and the sign would be able to place them where they wanted them to go. And our contractor also assisted in the placement of those items with their equipment as well. And the process went really smoothly because of the communication between all the parties beforehand and then also during installation. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some of the fun stuff, some of the challenges and successes. So our first challenge was just getting this project started. We started construction at the very beginning of COVID. So this was our first virtual pre-bid and pre-con meeting. We had never done a pre-bid that wasn't on site. So we had to get a little bit clever with how we could do a virtual project walkthrough. So we used a PowerPoint with photos and we kind of virtually walked through the site on Zoom, which I know seems like really easy now, but at the time it was totally brand new to us. So we also created some exhibits in Bluebeam to help kind of visually show some of the information like lay down areas, hall routes and photo locations. So another challenge on this project was schedule. We were on a really tight schedule. As I've mentioned, we had this housing developer coming in right behind us for phase two. So we needed to get phase one done ASAP, but we also needed to be really careful to install things properly and record everything carefully and any changes to utility locations, no matter how small we needed to really keep track of. So that was really important. Um, but so this project was vested under the 1993 King County Road Standards and the 1998 Surface Water Design Manual. Um, and because of that vesting, in order to maintain that, we had this requirement that we needed to start construction. That was the term that they used, start construction by July 1st of 2021. And start construction, as you can kind of see the definition here, um, for this project, that meant that both parcels needed to essentially be fully graded by that point in 2021. And if we missed that cutoff date, the entire division eight would need to be redesigned and re-permitted. So obviously that would have huge cost and schedule impact. So that was just absolutely not an option. So that meant we needed to work really diligently with our contractor to keep the project on schedule look ahead to foresee any potential delays coming down the pipeline and try to mitigate them. So another challenge during construction that we faced was we needed to replace an entire water line due to an unforeseen utility conflict. So to avoid large schedule delays as a result of this, our construction management team got together with the design team to develop two alternatives. And this was something that I think really benefited from having the design team and the construction management team being the same company because we were able to have the CM team out in the field providing real time live data back to the design team in the office. We also included the contractor in this process as well to be sure that constructability was accounted for. And then we worked with King County Housing Authority and some of the jurisdictional authorities like the water district to choose the best option to proceed. Um, so luckily avoided too much um, schedule impacts with that. But then another challenge on this project was that we had no dedicated on-site office or trailer for this project. And this was a little bit different than the Fourth Avenue project that we had done in 2019 because we had on that project, we had access to King County Housing Authority's office, which is right there on site. So really convenient. And we were co-located with King County Housing Authority and we were right near the contractor. Um, but because of COVID, we didn't have access to that office for this project. So it was a little bit more challenging during construction since we were traveling back and forth more often from our office, which is in downtown Seattle. Um, like I said, rather than kind of being full-time on site with the contractor, co-located with our client, 
So that was a little bit of a challenge and it just made communication that much more important between us and King County Housing Authority and us and the contractor since we weren't all together all the time. And then the photo here is the COVID station that our contractor set up. And this was something really new at the time, but something that needed to be done for everyone's health and safety. So we had a sign in sheet um, that took down contact information, hand sanitizer, thermometers, and we also required everyone on site to wear a mask, which was new for everyone. So it took a little bit of adjusting, especially making sure that our contractor and their subcontractors were complying with all of our COVID requirements on site. So another challenge on this project was the weather, as you can see in our photos here. We had major rain and snow during the winter of 2020, which caused some schedule delays. And since this project had HMA, which is hot mix asphalt, concrete, and deep excavation work, it was really weather dependent. So we had to just kind of work with our contractor to do what we could during the bad weather and work to really maintain our stormwater and erosion control, best management practices. And then once the weather cleared, we worked with our contractor to actually accelerate the schedule so that we could kind of get back on track, you know, again, because of this project vesting, the schedule was so important. So we had them provide extra crews on site and work some weekends to try to gain back some of the time that we had lost from these weather impacts. Another challenge we encountered was this ADA ramp on the corner of 4th Avenue and 102nd. The adjacent roadway here was super steep. And so it took a lot of coordination with our King County inspector and the concrete crew to make sure that this met ADA requirements since the tolerances were super tight. So as you can kind of see in the upper right photo here, we got the design team out in the field um, so they could help provide input on the ramp construction and the interface with the existing roadway and the patch paving that we had to do. And then another challenge was the asphalt work on this project. Since this project was vested under those 1993 King County Road Standards, we were held to those standards and they actually don't specifically have a compaction percentage requirement for asphalt. Um, and just to kind of go into that a little bit, I don't know, for those who don't know, um, typically on road projects, the asphalt needs to meet certain criteria to verify that it's been properly applied and compacted, and that makes sure that it holds up over time. And this is done by using a compaction percentage, which we verify on site using a testing consultant that comes out and they take some readings of the asphalt using a nuclear densometer, and they kind of compare their reading, readings against the required compaction percentage. But due to the fact that we didn't have a compaction percentage requirement, we had some challenges in approving the HMA paving during construction, as there was some disagreement about what the percentage should actually be. Uh, ultimately, we defaulted to the wash dot spec, but this did lead you know, to a need to redo some of the asphalt that hadn't met that requirement during construction. Okay, moving on to successes, some of the stuff that went well during construction. We had a really easy to work with contractor. We'd worked with them in the past and we actually just worked with them again over the summer and just wrapped up another awesome project with them. And we also have a really great client in King County Housing Authority that we've been working with for many years now. Another thing that went really well was the communication within our KPFF team. Communication flowed really nicely between the design team and the CM team, which led to quicker turnaround times for RFIs and submittals. And it was a lot quicker and easier to address issues that came up during construction. And then of course we implemented this new document control system, which was VPO. And this was the first project that we had used this system on. It was kind of a trial but it was really easy to use. So everyone was able to learn it really quickly. And because it went so well and it made 
RFI and submittal tracking really easy. We started using it on lots of projects soon after this, and we're actually up to 11 projects now. So um, since this project started at the beginning of the pandemic, we were really eager to leverage as many online tools as we could. So this was our first project in VPO, like I said. Um, our contractor could upload all of their submittals into VPO, and then we could route it around to the design team or whoever needed to review it. And it makes it really easy to see the status of any submittal at any given time. And one thing that was really helpful was that VPO automatically produces the submittal log for us. So we didn't have to create our own tracking sheet and track things manually as they went back and forth, which is what we used to do when we had projects running through email. And so the screenshots here show uh, on the bottom left, the submittal workflow page in VPO. Um, and then the upper right here shows the ability to print the submittal log into a PDF or Excel file. And I use this feature in particular all the time. It's so convenient, especially for meeting agendas or minutes to be able to pull all of the, the you know, current status of all the submittals right out of VPO and put it in an Excel sheet or a PDF and then add it into my meeting minutes. It's super great. So this was a public project with a lot of agencies involved. And so it was really important for us to keep all of our documents really organized, have everything readily available for review at any time by project stakeholders. So like I said, everything had to be organized, easy to find, easy to send around. So we created some different folders in VPO to host our files. And I've really leveraged this tool moving forward in other projects. We keep everything in VPO. So that includes things like tracking for grant funding requirements like Buy America. We keep all of our documents and our tracking sheets right in VPO and the project team can access it at any time. And then we also have the ability to set permissions for viewing. So we created some folders where we can keep internal documents that the contractor doesn't have access to. And then version history is also important to us and was important to us on this project. So VPO tracks whenever something gets changed and when, and you can access that information at any time. And so that's the screenshot here in the upper right, you can see the version history for a submittal. And it kind of shows, like I said, exactly who sent what to when and what they changed on it. And then on the lower left, we have a document library where we hosted some of our daily reports. So we did have some changes on this project, as I mentioned, things like some unforeseen utility conflicts, and we had some schedule acceleration, things like that. And VPO made it really easy to track changes on this project. We used VPO to track all of our PCOs, which are potential change orders. And our contractor could go in here and upload all of their cost proposals or backup information right into the PCO. And then we could negotiate through VPO and all of that back and forth would get tracked and saved. And you can convert the final PCO package into a PDF. And then that made it really easy to assemble change order packages with multiple PCOs. We would take a few PCOs and compile them into a final package. It already had all of the backup documentation and cost proposal information and negotiations in there, which is a huge time saver. So moving into closeout, we did our entire punch list for this project in VPO. And we also compiled all of our closeout documentation in VPO. And the screenshots here are the punch list module up on the right, and then the punch list PDF that it produced on the left here. And it just formatted everything automatically for us, which made it really convenient. And it was also really easy to archive everything off of VPO. There's just a button to click, which also just really helps during the closeout process, really streamlines the process.
So this is the email that we got to say that we'd met our vesting requirement. We completed the requirement to start construction by completing all of our grading by July 1st. So this was super exciting. This is definitely a big construction success. And moving along into some closing comments here. Uh, my biggest takeaway from this project was the relationships that we gained. So, you know, between us and VPO, like I said, we have about 11 projects now that we've done in VPO. We also built some great relationships with jurisdictional authorities, continuing some relationships that we had from the Fourth Avenue project. Like I mentioned, we had already kind of gone through this road closure process. So we carried that with us into this Division 8 project and we'll carry that on into the next one. And then between us and our client, King County Housing Authority, like I said, we worked with them for years now, really great client, and also between us and our contractor. Another pretty cool thing about this project, construction management was performed by an all women team and VPO is a woman owned business. So it was really great to have amazing women on this project, and I'm really proud of what our team accomplished. That brings us to the end here, and I'll open it up for questions. All right, great. Thanks so much, Brianna. Um, so one thing before we get into the questions, Laura mentioned it earlier, uh, I encourage everybody to send questions through the Q&A uh, option you should see towards the bottom of your screen. And uh, we'll answer them. Uh, we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, time restraints or content restraints might keep us from giving a chance to go over every question, but we'll, we can follow up as well. So before we get going, um, I have a question that I wanted to ask just based off of listening to your presentation today. You talked about the um, impact this project has had on the community. Uh, have you gotten any feedback from the community and how's it been based off the project so far? You know, I haven't personally, but like I said, that community presentation that we did for Fourth Avenue was so meaningful for me. I really think back to that and the people that I got to interact with during that presentation. We did have people in the community kind of stop by while we were doing construction. So I know for a fact that this really has had a big impact in the community. And actually, I personally live not too far from here. So I travel on Fourth Avenue and on Fifth Avenue on these roads. Um, and so for me, there's kind of a personal side of it too, where this road is so much safer to drive on now. So that's pretty cool. It's close. I, I was surprised when you said that, you know, the design of the sidewalks and the, and the different way, the curvature of, of the, the roadway would affect safety. So that was a takeaway I got too. Yeah, for sure. All right, here's some other questions that we, we have here as well. Um, you, you were talking about um, starting off the project right, right when COVID was really ramping up. At what point did you and your team realize that COVID would cause your team and contractors working the field to have to adapt? Yeah, so that was actually pretty early on. We were kind of wrapping up design right at the beginning of COVID. And so actually the tail end of design, which I was, I'm not a designer, like I've said, I'm a, you know, construction manager, but I was involved a little bit with the design here, particularly towards the end. We worked with our design team to make sure that things would be constructible and kind of provide some comments related to construction. So as we were wrapping up design, we had to move everything into teams. Um, so we kind of knew at that point and we were able to incorporate some things into our specifications and things like that to account for COVID. And we required a COVID safety plan from our contractor and things like that. So it was, it was all, you know, as everyone knows, like it was happening so fast, but we were trying to just adapt as we, as we did it. Absolutely. Um, a question that just came in here. How did how did you manage pre-construction design and the construction phase in VPO? Did you split the two phases in coordination or run both phases through the same project? 
Yeah, so we actually didn't do our pre-construction process in VPO on this project. And that's something, you know, this, this was, like I said, it was all kind of happening so fast. We were going into COVID. We were trying to leverage our online tools. Um, so it wasn't something that we really had available for us during pre-construction. And this was our pilot project in VPO. So we were kind of giving it a try, see how it went during construction. And it went so well that we have moved on to have other projects in there. And we are starting to use it more on the design side and in pre-construction. So that's an avenue that we have really started to explore, but on this particular project, um, didn't unfortunately get to take advantage of. All right. Could you could you go into detail and describe the process of engaging the contractor staff and the owner's team with VPO? Uh, and, and a follow up to that is what's gone well. What would you recommend others to keep in mind? So um, I think you know, of course, there's a little bit of um, a learning curve just like on my end. I think something that I would certainly do going forward, and that we do on all of our VPO projects now, is really make sure that everyone on the project team is in VPO and that I really like to just leverage the tool. So like I said, um, in my presentation, we're starting to leverage it more for everything. So I think on this project, there were still some things that we were kind of keeping outside of VPO. We were still kind of learning, a little hesitant. And so now I'm all in. I make sure everyone on the project is in the system. Everything goes in here. All of our tracking is in here. It's just so convenient to have everything in one place. All of our tracking spreadsheets now we put in to VPO so that people can access them at any time. Um, it really saves me a lot of time because then I'm not having to go through my files and send someone a link to something or send someone a PDF or an Excel sheet. It's, it's all right there at their fingertips as well. So it's really a time saver. We also do project team training, which I think is, is beneficial yes. and that you don't have to do the training either. You can kind of use us as a third party to, to do the training and answer any questions and concerns that people would have too. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. That's a really good point. I really like those trainings because it gives us an opportunity to talk through the workflow of the project and kind of talk to our contractor about our expectations as well. I mean, I know it's kind of showing them the system, but it kind of gives us a little bit of a um, kind of foot in the door, starting to coordinate those things with contractors as well. Regarding coordination and uh, when you were talking about challenges, uh, what, what was the biggest coordination challenge that you encountered on this project? Um, you know, I think just really trying to stay on top of schedule on this project was a big coordination challenge and the fact that we weren't necessarily on site all the time. I think we had, we got a little bit spoiled. It was such a luxury on the previous project on 4th Avenue to be located out on site with our contractor. And if I got a phone call, I could just walk out the door and go talk to them or look at whatever they were working on. So I think that was a little bit of a coordination challenge on this project was not having all of us located together in the same place um, and really trying to make sure that the schedule stayed on track and that we were all tracking and progressing like we needed to in order to meet our vesting requirement. All right. Uh, was, this a, was this a lump sum based contract or were there bid items that were tracked for monthly pay applications? This is a lump sum, lump sum project. With a with a schedule of values breakdown, but yeah, lump sum. Um, all right, we're getting a nice nice amount of questions coming in here. Um, uh, another VPO question: How how do you think coordinating the phase one of this project would have been different without VPO? Oh my goodness, um, I I certainly think it would have it would have been different. Um, it's so funny because now it's like I I try to have all my projects in VPO. I can't imagine things without it. So um, I think a big a big one is the potential change order tracking. I think that is a tool that I rely on so much now is just having all of that information in VPO because it makes it so easy to compile a change order, which, you know, I don't know um, who's on the call, but that's that can be a pretty 
tedious task. So it just really streamlines that process. So that I think that would have been different if we didn't have VPO. Was was there anything from this particular project that you carried into other projects? Um, well, I think the obvious one is our use of VPO. And I think we took some lessons learned, uh, like I was kind of saying, where maybe there was some parts of VPO that we weren't leveraging as much as we could. And so moving forward, um, we've really started to leverage those tools and it's kind of become our primary way that we're running projects, which is really awesome. Okay, um, here's some more here. Are there any um, improvements to the VPO platform or workflows that would be helpful for your users? Um, you know, I think that's something that VPO asks us all the time. You know, you guys are constantly trying to improve, constantly asking for feedback on the system, uh, which I really appreciate. So um, honestly, you know, I've, I've been asked that question before by VPO and I don't really have any improvements. It's nice because the system is customized for us. So when we set up VPO in the first place, we went through a process of, you know, where VPO talked to us and I felt like they really understood our way of doing things, the way that our company works, the structure of our company, because we're a little bit unique. And they really took the time to understand that and then build a system, or I should say, customize the system to meet the functions that we needed. So all of my functions that I need have been already customized for, for me, which is great. I think you had a very clear vision also that helped streamline how quickly we got VPO up and running too, because you had it all in your head. We just had yeah. to extract yeah. that information from you and then build the system exactly. around it. And you kept things simple, which I like in that you didn't try to do too much all at once too. I think that was success successful. How, how were you able to manage and track des, uh, design decisions between the client and design team? Um, so I'm not sure if the question is asking about design decisions during design or like during construction on things like some of the utility conflicts that we encountered. Um, I can't speak as much to the design side of things since I'm not a designer, but during construction, we um, typically were presenting a couple of different options to our client. I think it's important to um, kind of you know, selectively, you don't want to provide all of the engineering background that's just like way too much data. So typically, I think we were trying to provide a couple of different solutions that um, made sense to us and then present those in a in a way that was easy for our client to digest and talk through the options and then make a decision collaboratively. I think as a company, we tend to be pretty collaborative. So that was kind of our approach with with things like that. Okay, uh, and, for, and for that attendee that asked that question, if you wanna go into a little more detail while we have time, I encourage you to do so. Otherwise you can just send us a message or an email afterwards. Um, let's see here, uh, some more VPO centric questions here. Uh, does VPO support scheduling or progress payment invoicing controls? Laura, I don't know if you'd like to take that one. Um, sure, and I, I would be interested in what you, um, if you want to share, Brianna, how you manage the schedule, um, that would be good. But yes, we have scheduling uh, capabilities as far as um, you can choose the tool of choice and then you can publish the information in VPO or with certain applications like Microsoft Project, we have online opportunities to manage the schedule within VPO. Um, so each client, support, you know, does scheduling a little differently. Um, so we kind of leave it up to you as to what you want to use. Um, for the payment application question, yes, we can track and manage all the payment uh, application information in VPO as well. Yeah, I'll just add um, for scheduling, we weren't necessarily creating schedules in VPO, but we would have our contractor upload their uh, look ahead schedules and then submit their updated CPM schedules 
uh, on a regular basis into VPO. And so we could either do that through the submittals module or create a folder. There's a, we have a folder for schedules, so they could upload all their schedules there. Um, and then, yeah, there is a pay apps module as well. So we could track all of that. Great. Well, uh, I'll just point out to our attendees here that we this is we've come up on our last question here. So if you do have any other questions, I encourage you to send one out right now. Uh, we can always follow up later. Um, so uh, this particular project you mentioned was your pilot project for using VPO. Uh, when you decided to use VPO on projects afterwards, um, was it uh, did you have to create it from scratch or were you able to build off the existing template? Yeah, we built off the, the template. That's the great thing. We kind of had gone through this process of creating a template with VPO and then that just exists now and we can recreate that template for all of our future projects. Okay, and uh, it looks like someone took my request to heart. Another question came in here. Um, can you go and if, if you want to, can you talk about King County satisfaction level regarding how this project turned out? Oh, well, um, I know for sure King County Housing Authority was super happy with the way this project went. Um, we did actually pursue an award, um, I think earlier this year for this project. Didn't win it, but it was a pretty fun process to go through and they're just a really great client to work with. And um, yeah, so that, that was really cool. Really great experience. All right, well, uh, that's, uh, that's all we have on my end here. Uh, I, at this point, Laura, I'll kick it back to you. Great, thank you. Well, Brianna, we wanna thank you so much for sharing your experience and your expertise with the uh, audience today. Um, you are a valued customer, KPFF and the VPO relationship has been great um, and rewarding for all. I mean, you've also introduced us to your clients in some cases where they required their own project management tool. And we've been able to expand the business with that. So for that, we're greatly appreciative. And for you to take the time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk to our audience today and share your experience with everyone, I think that's, uh, that's great of you to do. So thank you very much. Um, if anybody does have any follow-up questions that didn't come out of this, um, feel free to reach out to anyone on our team, uh, Brianna as well. Like I said, we'll be sharing the slide deck with uh, any of our registrants, but if anyone has any um, questions, please feel free to reach out and enjoy the rest of your day. Hopefully it's not snowing where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura and Josiah. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna.